Well, edge lit dimming is complete trash, so <laughs> there's that. Backlight technology exists that, that solved that problem. You know, obviously the bit that really winds me up is those screens that are advertised with HDR but have none of the HDR capabilities. I'd really like to see that phased out. You know, don't call it HDR, don't use HDR 400 branding. If the screen can't support any HDR capabilities, I just think it's massively misleading to consumers and that's one of those things that I really think needs to go. You know, if that's the standard we're setting for HDR, then we could have had HDR years ago. What about uh, other things that you'd like to see change in the market? So like, if there was one monitor spec that you could scrap or change or, 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 or have manufacturers use in a better way, what would it be? I think I know what it's probably <laughs> going to be, but I'll, I'll ask anyway. You reckon it's going to be the one millisecond response time stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every monitor is a one millisecond monitor, so it's just pointless. Have you seen much of Vaser's Clear MR? Have you have you looked at the, into that scheme and what that means for <laughs> motion clarity and response times and that kind of thing? Yeah. As an example, one of the rules was you can't have your blur reduction mode enabled. Well, why not? I mean, this is about motion clarity, and it, and it allows manufacturers to fudge the numbers and get awarded a a high tier certification. There seems to be this increasing tendency for monitors to ship with firmware issues. They should know that that's a key feature that needs to be enabled together. What's your view on the different flavors of backlight dimming that you've got in that space? Like I know mini LED is starting to become more common, but what about like mini LED versus edge lit versus no, <laughs> no dimming. You know, where, where do you th what do you think about that? Well, edge lit dimming is complete trash. So <laughs> there's that. Um, yeah, it's. Um, I guess when edge lit dimming sort of came into to fashion, I guess it was sort of a way for monitor manufacturers to fake their way to HDR, for a lack of a better term. You know, they're sort of. They want to advertise HDR capabilities when panels weren't being produced with proper mini LED backlights that would give people a great HDR experience. So they kind of, you know, what can we do when all the backlights are edge lit? Well, we, we'll split into a few zones and hopefully that will do something. Turns out that doesn't actually do that much. But, you know, it's that sort of felt like t today edge lit feels very much like an old technology. Like that was what came first maybe it didn't really come first because tvs were doing full array local dimming but whatever it felt like it came first and now really i think in 2023 if you're looking at truly advertising your product as being hdr capable especially for a high-end price point then it needs to have a mini led backlight i don't think there's really any excuse these days for you know having a product and pushing it especially if it's like 800 a thousand dollars us pushing that saying this can do really good hdr and it's edge lit like the backlight, like there's backlight technology exists that that solved that problem, and yeah, I think we're we're definitely moving in the right direction. But there's still some monitors like PG27 AQN as an example that you know 1440p 360Hz is a great product. There's plenty of reasons to buy it, but HDR isn't one of them. And really, that probably shouldn't have been advertised as HDR. Didn't really need HDR branding because it's got its own set of of benefits. But if they did want that product to be advertised and priced in the HDR range, then the edge lit panel needs to be swapped out with full array local dimming. It's just really as simple as that, in my opinion. And just judging by some of your reviews that I've read, um, I imagine that you share a pretty similar opinion. Yeah, definitely. I, I think um, it's, it's going to be impossible for manufacturers not to advertise HDR nowadays, right? Because everyone expects it. So, you know, but I... <laughs> I agree that you've got mini LED backlights now at more affordable rates. You know, you've got Cooler Master. We both reviewed the GP27U and the GP27Q. You know, we're talking about screens that are 800 US or I think it's 600 US for the, the 1440p model um, with 576 zone mini LED backlights. So, you know, those are more affordable. You know, they're not budget, obviously, but they mm -hmm. are at the same, they're not, Two thousand, three thousand dollars, like the first FALD backlights were. I think, um, you know, for me, edge lit, 
like you say, it's not going to produce a decent HDR experience. But if you've got a reasonable number of zones, you know, I'm not I'm not talking about eight zones or something, but if you had like 32 edge lit zones, it can help at least with offering a higher peak brightness for HDR. You know, maybe you'll get into the 600 nits range and above, you know, the HDR 600 certification. And while at the same time, not sacrificing parts of the image that might be darker, obviously the, the level of control of the image is pretty poor and you're not going to get anywhere near the level of contrast that you'd get from a mini LED or an OLED or something. But at the same time, I think it's it's okay for those budget models. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess I should qualify my statement for being trash as in trash as for high-end product, right? Like a product that's really advertising it as being HDR capable. You know, I'm not expecting mini LED to be feasible for today's 300, 400, even some $500 products. I think that's generally out of reach, but certainly if you were getting just like $800 tier, then even like 32 edge lit zones is like, yeah, I'd probably want that to be like 576 zone FALD if possible. You know, the Sony InZone M9 even had 96 zone FALD, which is not amazing or anything, but does offer that step up from, from edge lit. So yeah. I th- yeah. I think FALD is probably your your bottom line for anything that you consider a higher priced, more premium product if, if you want to promote it as HDR. You know, um, you know, obviously the bit that really winds me up is those screens that are advertised with HDR but have none of the HDR capabilities and faces mm-hmm. HDR 400 certification, you know, if you can even call it that. You know, I think <laughs> there's a lot of that in the market and I, I'd, I'd really like to see that phased out. You know, don't call it HDR, don't use HDR 400 branding if the screen can't support any HDR capabilities. And I don't count... I don't even count a 400 nits peak brightness as an HDR capability. You know, you can get that from loads of SDR monitors. Um, but if you've got a screen with no local dimming at all, no wide gamut backlight, no 10-bit color depth support, it, it shouldn't be promoted as HDR. I just think it's massively misleading to consumers. And that's one of those things yeah. that I really think needs to go. Yeah, I, I've seen... I always see the occasional comment of people with display HDR 400 products that are like, hey, I enabled this with HDR on and it looks great for HDR. You know, why are you complaining about this? And I think it's it's easy to, I don't want to say these people, it, it's kind of hard. So I think it's easy to be fooled a little bit by HDR on those sorts of products because normal usage conditions with SDR, you're probably running the monitor at sort of a mid-level brightness. It's obviously using standard tone mapping, sRGB, or you know just flat 2.2 sort of gamma. And you turn into the HDR mode, and usually it will increase the brightness the whole way if you have no local dimming capabilities. It will change the tone mapping and the, the EOTF to you know, the, the PQ EOTF for HDR, and it will stop using sRGB, which does change the look of the monitor. It's allocating more of the data, the bit range into the dark and shadow content. So it will appear different because it's not running in the same way, but that doesn't really mean that you were getting an HDR product. It's more that you know, if that's the standard we're setting for HDR, then we could have had HDR years ago. It could have just been done on any SDR product. All you had to do was change the tone mapping and increase the monitor to run at maximum brightness whenever you enable the HDR mode, which to me, I don't think that should really qualify as an HDR product. It has to offer it has to offer a set of new functionality that those screens weren't capable of. And obviously you listed what those things should be just before. But yes, yeah, certainly products that don't meet as I've sort of called in my review, sort of the three pillars of HDR with brightness, contrast, and the color performance in some way, really, yeah, Vase's display HDR 400 standard is atrocious and just should not exist. It's, I, I, I struggle to think of a monitor that wouldn't be able to pass that spec. It's very, very loose. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, that it's the equivalent to me of having like a vivid mode on a monitor or a TV where you just switch it on and it's yeah. suddenly pumped up to maximum color, the vibrancy is increased, the brightness is increased, whatever it is. And yeah, I mean, maybe the image does look good and maybe it would look better for gaming. But at the same time, HDR, you know, that, that stands for high dynamic range. And if you've got, 
if you haven't got the technology in the screen itself to even increase your dynamic range beyond the standard, then it's not a high dana- dynamic range product. It just lacks the yeah. fundamental capability to increase the dynamic range or the contrast ratio. And and I just think it's it's just misleading. And yeah, you know, hopefully maybe one day that will stop or, or people will start to realise that HDR 400 is just pointless. I mean, you and I talk about it enough, so maybe <laughs> people will listen at some point. I, I think it'll come down a lot to people using proper HDR products because I think if, as I sort of saying with the my display HDR 400 example, if that was sort of your first experience of HDR in a serious way, and you know things have changed, as I said, brightness tone mappings change, you might go, okay, that, that looks okay, like it looks different, it looks better because it's just tuned differently. But then if that person went and looked at an OLED or looked at a proper full array local dimming LCD, then they're going to get a very different experience that is going to make what they had look very bad in comparison. And I think that's the sort of, you know, it's kind of hard because you can't show in a video on an SDR panel what HDR looks like because the, the display is fundamentally incapable of showing it. So, you know, I think maybe as people's phones have... You know, a lot of phones these days using OLED screens, people maybe as more content is supported in HDR on those sorts of products, that people will sort of get a feel for where the limitations are of their monitor. And they'll make it harder for those sort of entry level, no local dimming sort of products to sell as HDR products. Because if people have more exposure to what it should look like, then the product that they will have received just won't live up to their expectations. And that's ultimately what's going to cause that sort of movement and, ch- and change in that market. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, it's people who are happy with those screens and go, this is a brilliant HDR experience. I, you know, I really want to say, oh, here's a look, look at this OLED screen. You know, that is what a real contrast ratio, that is what a real high <laughs> yeah. dynamic range image is supposed to look like. And, you know, yeah, maybe it doesn't get as bright or, or whatever, but... There's there's a reason why these names, you know, these technologies exist, and screens that lack them just are, I just have no place in terms of HDR marketing for me. Um, what about um, what about uh, other things that you'd like to see changed in the market? So, like, if there was one monitor spec that you could scrap or change or or or, or have manufacturers use. In a better way, what would it be? I think I know what it's probably <laughs> going to be, but I'll, I'll ask anyway. You reckon it's going to be the one millisecond response time stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think Vaser has tried and sort of largely failed. Well, I guess they haven't really... Their new brandings for various different response times haven't really come to market in any significant way, but judging by the specs, it doesn't look like that's going to be a, a proper solution to the problem. But anyway, one millisecond response times obviously is just not great marketing. Um, and they've kind of put themselves into this race with OLEDs now where some OLEDs are like claiming things like 0.01 millisecond response times, which is like... Really? Which is also stupid. Mm. It's just... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like, like like 0.1 milliseconds, I think that's somewhat okay. Like it's, you know, on average in my testing, it's not quite 0.1 of a millisecond, but you're getting the message across. It's, it's fast, it's, you know... It's, it's more likely to hit 0.1 millisecond than a standard LCD is at hitting one millisecond. So, you know, from that standpoint, it's like, yeah, I can sort of, I'm sort of okay with that. But the LCD stuff, you know, every monitor is a one millisecond monitor. So it's just pointless. It's like if everything's advertised with that spec, then what's the point of having it? You just, just get rid of it. It's, it's stupid. And, you know, I imagine that it's largely driven by, the testing tools that these companies use that, uh, you know, I'm not super familiar with how companies do their own internal validation for those spec sheets. But my understanding is that there are commercially available products that spit out response time numbers. So I imagine that, you know, there's some manipulation with things like overdrive settings so that this tool that they've got spits out that number so they can advertise it. But, you know, the, the way that they're sort of manipulating it, usually using ridiculous overdrive settings and so on, you know, it's not helpful to the consumer if the one millisecond mode is the fastest overdrive setting with ridiculous overshoot. Like, no. No one's no, going to use that. At least on an OLED, even though they're advertising 0.1 or 0.01 or whatever, at least you know when it does hit that, it's going to do it without excessive overshoot. You know, you're going to get... Yeah. It, it might be your best case cherry-picked response time and, and maybe on average it's more like 0.5 milliseconds or maybe one millisecond or whatever, but... 
you at least know it can reach that and the performance isn't going to be ruined by a load of overshoot. Whereas on an LCD, when you see one millisecond, you know, you immediately know that, you know, maybe best case it can reach that, but it's probably going to be in some ridiculous over overshoot uh, overdrive mode with a load of halos and trails. It's just totally meaningless. And that and the one millisecond uh, motion moving picture response time, the MPR T-spec is another one that's just totally pointless. You know, that basically just means, hey, we've got a blur reduction mode. You know, it might as well not exist <laughs> as a spec. You know, yeah, um, just the, just the, those terminologies and things. Just if you if you're attempting to just make every product a one millisecond product, but you're not actually doing that by improving its tuning and imp- actually improving its performance, and you're just focused on basically cheating the system and coming up with loopholes and workarounds and oh, we're going to call it MPRT instead of greater gray because we changed the measurement method, therefore now we can just claim it. it's what we want it to be. Why not just say it's a 0.1 millisecond monitor and say we're measuring the first 5% of the transition? Like, th- there's nothing stopping a, a manufacturer from doing that. Don't you know, give they them could ideas, say, Tim. Come on. They'll be doing I that I mean, now. they could say that. <laughs> um, but certainly they, they shouldn't be. But, I, you know, I, I think it's almost a lost cause at this point. No monitor manufacturer is going to say, well, our monitor is actually 5 milliseconds because then it looks bad compared to the competition. They're just, it's kind of, I, I think as we move into the OLED era, we've kind of got this opportunity to make sure that OLEDs aren't advertised incorrectly. But I think for LCDs, yeah, I don't really know what the solution is. No. I mean, ironically, though, for me, if as someone who's been around the market for a long time and understands this stuff, if I saw a monitor being advertised with a, three millisecond response time, five millisecond response time, I might actually think to myself, actually, that is probably more likely to be a better screen than some of the one millisecond, because at least they're being honest about the spec. And yeah. and if it really reaches three millisecond gray to gray, that's decent performance. You know, that's fast enough to yeah. keep up with high refresh rates. And so, you know, manufacturer honesty goes a long way, I think. And, and if people, if if they would be brave enough to you know, use some of these specs that maybe don't keep up with the market, but might give consumers, a, you know, the feeling like they're going to get a product that actually lives up to the spec instead of it not performing, then, you know, maybe that could start to, to turn. Yeah, I've seen I've seen a couple of brands go with the more honest advertising at times. I saw it once with Razer. The overall product was pretty bad. I gave it quite a harsh review, but they did they didn't advertise one millisecond response times. They advertised like can't quite remember the numbers, but it was like five to seven millisecond range, and it wasn't that far off. And I've just received a Lenovo monitor to review that in their spec sheet that they provided, it actually listed the performance of the different modes. So like they had level one overdrive listed with like eight milliseconds, level two at four milliseconds or whatever it was. And I've just been testing that earlier today. And again, those numbers are relatively close, certainly closer than one millisecond gets to most monitors um, to the point where it's probably fair for that. That advertising is certainly fair. Um, And yeah, I'd like to see more of that. But again, does that put Lenovo or Razer at a competitive disadvantage compared to you know for the, the casual buyer that doesn't watch our reviews or read your reviews and yeah, it's a hard one. I certainly think that you know, if a company wants to go down that path, then potentially they could build up some trust with you know everyday consumers. But again, they're probably still sort of targeting enthusiasts that actually look into that stuff and are keeping up with you know who's who's doing things accurately and who's not. You know, you very much have to be in the in the space, I guess, to um, keep up with all those things that are going on. Yeah. Yeah, have you seen much of the Vasa's Clear MR? Have you have you looked at the, into that scheme and what that means for <laughs> motion clarity and response times and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, I had a look. It seems, I guess, my first thought. I mean, it's been a while. First of all, it's been a while since I've looked at it in depth. So you know, again, I probably need a bit of a refresher on some parts of it. But I, I think the numbering scheme to me seemed very confusing. Um, it wasn't like I think they were ranking them at like in the thousands or something, which to me, you know, that, what does that mean? You know, a consumer is going to know what it means easily. Like is 1,000 or 2,000 a good number? That needs to be very obvious. Um, And I felt that wasn't really um, possible with that sort of spec, but just also the way that they were testing those products, just looking through the, you know, the, the, 
testing methodology that they left that they you know provided didn't seem particularly robust, and there was certainly a few emissions, which don't ask me what they were. I just remember there being a few at the time. Um, sort of the the testing was yeah probably not as stringent as I would like to see if they were going to try and solve the sort of one millisecond issues. And I think there was a video um, from one of the YouTubers, can't quite remember who it was, that did a good breakdown of the standard and sort of pointed out a few issues with it and sort of the went through the testing and all that. Can't quite remember who it was, but um, yeah. I'll link it know, in the comments below at the, at the yeah. end. And um, yeah, I, I think I know the one you mean, but I'll, I'll make sure it's linked in the description. And I think um, they seem to have adopted this approach of the higher number, the better, which is, you know, okay in principle if people understand what the scheme's about. But there were a lot of holes in the, the certification process for me. Like it was, for as an example, one of the rules was you can't have your blur reduction mode enabled. Well, why not? I mean... This is about motion clarity. If you've gone to the yeah, lengths of installing a, you know, making a um, a decent blur reduction mode available and it works and it's been tweaked and maybe the blur busters guys have got behind it and they've tuned it or whatever, then why why shouldn't that count? Why can't your screen be rewarded for having that? And then the other one was it it was measured only at native refresh rate and native re resolution, which obviously is your 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 best case scenario but what about situations when vrr is active what about situations where you've got an external input device like a games console that runs at 1080p 60 hertz or something you know like it's not going to tell the full story and it, and it allows manufacturers to fudge the numbers and get awarded a, a high tier certification and look good on the face of it when actually your most common use case where someone might use it at you know, maybe they can't drive the maximum refresh rate, so they're going to use G-Sync or FreeSync. Maybe that's more common, and actually the performance could be terrible. You know, it's really hard to... Mm. Obviously, it's a very hard thing to do. You know, I'm not... I don't yeah. want to say they're not trying, because obviously they are, and it's all, it's all good if you can get to a point where these certifications mean something and they're of value, but at the same time, when it's got big gaping holes, like it, quest it's, it brings into question for me whether it's going to be of much real value to people particularly, you know, particularly if you delve into it and understand what they mean. Yeah, I think from memory there was, I had some questions about how it was, it appeared to me to be um, minimising some of the flaws with LCD as opposed to OLED as an example where, you know, as you were saying, if you're measuring at just the maximum refresh rate, generally LCDs have worse performance at a given you know, overdrive setting as you get lower and lower in terms of refresh rate, which doesn't happen with an OLED. So, you know, the, it's kind of, if you're only testing at the maximum refresh rate, that is theoretically giving an advantage to LCDs when it maybe shouldn't be an advantage because you're kind of just deleting all that performance where LCDs kind of trail away compared to an OLED, you know, at the same sort of performance settings, which I, I wasn't a huge fan of. And they were, I think in some of their example numbers, they had some products ranked in similar tiers that I tested and found the motion clarity was actually quite different. And I thought that was a bit strange, which must have been related to the testing and how they weren't testing certain parts of the performance. Um, certainly OLEDs should smash that sort of motion clarity metrics, especially if they're testing without you know motion blur reduction features enabled, which again, as you said, is kind of a silly, um, silly choice. So... Yeah, I think, yeah, I don't want to say the standards bodies, uh, as you say, they're not, I don't think they're out to do a terrible job on purpose or anything, but I certainly have questions over, you know, there's obviously financial incentives and, you know, companies have to pay generally to use branding on boxes, pay for certifications and those sort of things. So when that's sort of part of a, a certification standard, I always find it like, you know, how much of the development of the standard is going into ensuring that a certain percentage of monitors can pass in a certain tier. Because if the standard is too harsh and nothing's getting certified, then, you know, there's potential financial issues there. Now, I don't want to say I know for sure exactly how VASA goes about those sort of processes. I don't know. But generally, when it comes to those sorts of brands and things, it could be a consideration and doesn't 
you know, it doesn't sit well with me as sort of an independent reviewer that tries not to, you know, tries to keep all that sort of money and testing as separate as possible when there's sort of that crossover. I don't know. I, it doesn't sit super well with me. No, no. I mean, I, th- I think, you know, maybe it could be improved in time. You know, I'm not against there being a new certification process or uh, some kind of tiers that help consumers understand the differences between monitors because you know as we talked about the response time specs are pretty much meaningless now mprt specs are meaningless so having something new is good but i think it's it's got to be it's got to address some of these concerns where you, you know you can't just shoehorn displays into one testing criteria and one set of rules and then and then miss out what is probably going to be a much bigger use case situation you know where where you really need a you need a rating system that spans across all these different scenarios which i know is going to be difficult but i just maybe there's more work to be done there maybe uh maybe it will improve in yeah. time i could say yeah it's very difficult i mean it's like it's trying to condense like if i tried to think about condensing all my performance testing into a number into like just one number it's very very difficult like Am I making a score? Is it related to some metric or something? You know, that's what I've that's why I tend to show is you know many different performance testing things that I've done in all the reviews. The same as your reviews and many other reviewers, it's very very difficult to to just consolidate into one number. So maybe a standard like that needs to have different numbers listed, which again you sort of increase in the complexity and the potential to confuse people and makes it hard to understand. But yeah, I don't know. It's, it's yeah, it's not a task that I'd be taking up anytime soon. If I, I would not want to be developing something like that. No, no, I agree. What else? There's one question. I Oh yeah, go, go on after you. Yeah. Yeah. There is one thing I wanted to ask you about, because I've found lately in some of um, my reviews, especially throughout the last year or so, that there seems to be, this increasing tendency for monitors to ship with firmware issues. And it feels like five years ago, sort of in the earlier parts of my, you know, display testing, I don't know whether you call it a career, but I guess that's what it is. Um, it felt like a lot more monitors shipped sort of basically complete. Like you get the monitor, there's really no problems with its included settings and stuff. And maybe there's like one or two minor bugs. But these days we're getting monitors shipping with what I would class as fairly deal-breaking issues. We've both just tested Cooler Masters monitors where things like HDR and VRR are not, ena- not able to be enabled at the same time in the initial firmware. And then the company needs to go and release a firmware update despite that product being shipped to customers. Not every customer is going to be familiar with the firmware update process. Um, it's not even going, maybe not even going to know that there's firmware updates available at all. Um, and it's just something that hasn't, it doesn't sit well with me. It feels like that's sort of an area to monitors that has been going backwards. And I, I really would like to see more monitors ship with almost final or very much very stable firmware. Have you sort of seen a trend for that in your testing over the last year or so? Yeah, I have. Yeah. And I, I think the Cooler Master examples are a, 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 yeah, are a good one because there was a quite a few things that didn't work. So you couldn't do uh 4k at 160 hertz which was the max refresh rate yep. you couldn't do local dimming at the same time as vrr and those are sort of they're big gaps and like you say maybe the product shouldn't have been shipped initially in that state you know th- those are things that people would expect particularly when you're advertising the screen with 4k 160 hertz and you're advertising yep. it with a mini led backlight and g-sync and whatever but to call a master's credit at least they did go back and you know very quickly updated the uh the firmware and at the same time it was updatable for the user you know they'd had the foresight to uh develop the monitor with a simple you know plug in a usb stick and flash the firmware from the on-screen menu you know it was very simple to do so at least you could do that the problem comes i think when you've got screens that are shipped with a bug that can't be addressed unless you send it back to the manufacturer which no one's really going to want to do or it's expensive or time consuming or whatever so i i think i'd like to see more more focus on making sure there aren't bugs you know that's an obvious thing any manufacturer should be doing you know and perhaps you know when there's screens being sent out to reviewers like yourself and myself and others who 
perhaps get them ahead of launch. You know, maybe that's a good time to identify some of these bugs and then fix them before they go to mass production. You know, I'm sure people would, not that I'm offering to be a bug tester, obviously, but at the same time, <laughs> people like to see reviews in advance of them being released. So why not get screens out to reviewers nice and early, give people the chance to hear about the screen before it's released, and then at the same time, pick out anything that might be big and address it before it does get rolled out. You know, I've seen that happen a couple of times in the past. And then if you, if you can't do that, then at least make the screen uh, have a feature where you can update the firmware yourself, you know, simply and easily without breaking it. You know, no one wants to RMA a screen when there's a problem. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, yeah I, I think, you know, personally, I, I might have a slightly different opinion on shipping monitors out to reviewers that need firmware issues. I don't, personally, I don't really think it's my job as a reviewer to test products for companies. That's that There should be someone at the company who does that. And I think, you know, the Cool Master example, again, it's a great example because something like HDR and VR, it shouldn't even require a reviewer to, to point that out. That should be, someone should be they should know that that's a key feature that needs to be enabled together. I have a bit more forgiveness for products where, you know, maybe there's like a sleep issue or, you know, there's maybe the tuning is slightly off for a setting that can be corrected later. That sort of stuff where I think reviewers can give good feedback. But I think for things like the maximum refresh rate is not usable with variable refresh rate, that's kind of like you should know that that's something that should be should be enabled. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that user upgradable firmware is an essential feature these days, especially because we don't, we often don't know that there are issues with products um, until well into testing or even after testing. There's been many sort of minor issues that I found, you know, I just I published the review, someone's like, hey, I've got this setup, you know, this specific setting doesn't work with my my setup and it's like okay i can't really test for that but at least the monitor has user upgradable firmware so then you can report the issue hopefully they'll fix it and roll something out there's also been monitors i've tested where they do have user upgradable firmware but then the process is just not suitable for consumers like there's there's i can't remember there's one monitor where you had to it was extremely complicated. You had to like run multiple utilities on your computer and put it into like a, a factory mode. And then you could flash the firmware. It had to all be done through a computer. You know, the, the level of complexity was, you know, far too high for a, a standard monitor buyer. Uh, and I'm not even sure if that firmware was ever going to be released to the public or whether, you know, the, the monitor was intended to have user upgradable firmware. But if that's the sort of steps that need to be taken, just, yeah, it needs to be like plug in a USB hit a button in the in the OSD settings and have it up, update. But yeah, I, I think there's, yeah, I, I think there's been too many products. I think there's the issues with the ASUS PG42 UQ HDR, uh, the Alienware AW3423DW, which didn't even have user upgradable firmware. So people like me that bought one of the first units, my, my monitor has issues that just can't be fixed. Uh, I can send it back. But, you know, do I, I mean, to be fair, I do actually have the DWF as well. But <laughs> if I send it back, it's like, how, how long is it going to take for them to reflash it? You know, there was that monitor has been out of stock for periods throughout the year, for, for long periods. So, you know, you may be waiting months. Um, and yeah, they gave me a hilarious reason for why that monitor couldn't be up, updated back in the day, which was obviously a load of crap. But um yeah, I just I'm yeah, I'm just not a huge fan. I, I think stability needs to be maybe coming more into focus in 2023. Yeah, and I guess that's going to be harder. You know, the more things people are adding to these screens, you know, the more yeah. technology you've got. You know, when you've got mini LED backlights that play, and I don't know, maybe some monitors even have got smart TV features that are being announced. You know, so yep. I guess it becomes more problematic. But at least make it user updatable or you know follow the follow what tvs do and have it updated via the main software automatically you know i i don't know you know there needs to be a way to tackle these bugs and improve screens over time um because the main problem really comes when you release a screen there is a bug and there's just no way for people to address that bug and they're either stuck with it or they send it back and i just don't yeah, think that's it, practical it, it gives monitor manufacturers the opportunity to to tune their products over time as well like if they see a review from someone where the performance maybe isn't as favorable as they wanted especially for things like hdr where 
you know, it, it feels almost these days like the SDR side of things is almost fixed. A lot of monitors ship in a, a very good state usually, uh, but HDR tends to be a bit more of a wild west, lots of different, you know, following of the EOTF curve and that sort of thing. So a lot of monitors, there's... And- yeah, weird white points, all sorts of things. There's certainly a lot of room for optimization there. And if you had user upgradable firmware, that allows them to work on that over time. Yeah, of course, it'd be better if the, you know, the product shipped with better tuning from the factory. But you know, things like that, it, it's a challenge. You know, a lot of these products are very new, using new technology, mini LED. You know, how you handle that is not really a, a super solved problem. There's very few products that have mini LED backlights. There's very few OLED gaming monitors with high refresh rates and that need to deal with all those challenges. So, you know, I get that there's going to be some gaps at times, but yeah, I I think having the opportunity to at least tune them later and improve them is definitely needed these days. Yeah, I agree. So I'm I'm conscious, Tim, we've been talking for a a good hour and a half now, you know, hopefully it's been useful and interesting to people. Maybe we should do another one in the future and take some user questions and viewer questions. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I always enjoy getting user feedback from people and sort of hearing what's the the hot topics that people want to be covered. But yeah, I see the I see the recording timer. It's very much a podcast for people. Hopefully, they're enjoying it on their on their daily commute or or some other um, sort of boring activity they want to do. So um, yeah, yeah, it was great to chat. It was yeah, I enjoyed this. I should probably do something on the old Monitors Unbox channel at some point in the future as well. Yeah, good stuff. Well, yeah, it's been good just to talk about this stuff really with a with a fellow enthusiast. And, you know, if people have got questions or comments, you know, please leave them in the description and the comment section below. And Tim and I will try and field those. And, you know, like I say, you know, we'll try and do a follow-up and answer some of those questions in a future video, a future chat um, on Monitor Unboxed or on TFT Central, whichever will we'll um, hopefully do these over time and just keep in touch about these things. I'm sure there'll be good, uh, you know, other good things to talk about in the near future as monitors get released and an exciting yeah, year ahead, sure. hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I expect it to be a very good year. So lots of, lots of exciting things happening and yeah, we should keep in touch when um, there's some, yeah, after some exciting releases in the next couple of months. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, brilliant. Thanks for joining me, Tim. Yeah. I'll um, speak to you at no some worries. point soon and thanks everyone for watching. Yeah, thanks everyone.